this is something that could have been and perhaps should have been done 50 years ago. She said, Brian, they've already forgotten who I am, and in a few years, they won't even know who Chris Everett is. She was correct. We couldn't believe it that there really isn't an American Tennis Hall of Fame. Well, how the idea came about is um, I've been involved in promoting America's best, whether it was McEnroe and Connors, Tracy Austin, Chris Everett have been wanting, I've, I've always believed that America's best athletes deserve America's best treatment. I moved to Charles City and met Mark Kuhn and he was preserving history with his grass court and and it sort of hit me with uh, the idea of there really should be an American Tennis Hall of Fame. Major League Baseball has Cooperstown. The National Football League has Canton. American Basketball has Springfield. Yet in 134 years of history in our country, American tennis is still left without a home. There are multiple aspects that go into creating that home. A Hall of Fame must have a strong community backing it, as well as a great passion for tennis from that community's members. Along with that passion, it's vital to go back to the roots and see why people fell in love with the game in the first place. I'm a farm boy. I'm from Ventura, California, and it was really interesting how I got started in tennis. I didn't want to play this game wearing these little white shorts when everyone's running around in their jeans and, and their cowboy boots, but my dad and mom uh, said, well, you know, if you want to ride your horse this summer, you're going to take a tennis lesson. And I had really no such desire to do so. And I just said, uh, well, if it means I can't ride my horse, I guess I better do it. The fortunate thing was I had a very inspiring, dynamic coach. Uh, every ball you hit, he made, made it feel like it was the most exciting thing in the world when you hit the strings and hit it over into the square and the box. Also, when I was taking this lesson, every move I made, he equated to another sport. In my day, it was like, you're stepping into the hit like Rocky Marciano steps, uh, steps into the punch, or you're, you're watching the ball like Ralph Kiner watches a pitch. So I got thinking, this isn't such a sissy game after all, and I really became intrigued with it. And then when I went home that night, I couldn't stop hitting the ball against the wall, of course, uh, against the garage, but we had a pebble gri driveway, so the ball was bouncing all over the place. But it became a challenge right away and, and really made the game exciting for me from that one lesson. My grandfather and I found tennis on his shortwave radio one afternoon when uh, we came across a broadcast of Wimbledon. And uh, we liked the accent, the way the game was scored, all the tradition, and so I started to play tennis. That was uh, in 1960 at the age of 10. My father said, I want you to take some tennis lessons. And at first I said, Dad, I, what is this? I'm not interested, you know. And then I tried playing tennis and the ball's flying all over the place. It's, a, it's not an easy sport to play. It's not as easy to play as most sports. In fact, the Romanians did a study of the two most difficult sports to master are fencing and tennis. Because there's a lot of elements, forehands, backhands, volleys, serving. So anyway, but I saw a player when I got into high school named Stan Smith. And he was 15, I was 14, and I watched him play and I thought, there's more to this than I realized. And I, I was drawn to the beauty of the game. I think for me as a teacher, and as I look back to all the teachers I've had who I've really respected, uh, the thrill for me is to make what I teach, tennis in this, this example, an exciting experience for other people, to try to, to show my passion for what it is I'm doing. Uh, the passion for the game I love so much. And I think you're good teachers in any subject in school, as an example, or your, your mentors in business, or your other great coaches are people who can inspire this by, by projecting their love and passion for what they're doing. Once an individual fully realizes that passion, it allows them to transfer the power of that love to the people around them. 
Wartburg tennis coach Mike Stridham has personal experience of how the passion for sport can connect a community. I got to see firsthand at the end of the apartheid era how sports really helped to cure, solve a lot of problems in a nation and kind of heal a nation. Um, I was 16 years old in 1995 when South Africa won the Rugby World Cup. Um, and Nelson Mandela came out, uh, gave the trophy to the Springboks at the time. And I think that was the first time that really the nation, kind of all colors, all races, were together on something. And more than anything, I think that healed that country. I think everybody looks to sport for some kind of enjoyment factor. Uh, life is tough. Uh, life is pretty hard for a lot of people. Uh, we have a down economy, but a sport is always there. It's something you can play on equal footing with people. It's something that you can always smile about and look forward to. So I think sport has the power to heal, to make us smile, to make us happy. I think it's the greatest thing in the world. That love for sport, and specifically tennis, can transform even the wildest of dreams into reality. As a young boy, Mark Kuhn envisioned himself having a Wimbledon of his very own, right in his backyard. In 1962, I was doing chores on the Kuhn family farm where the grass tennis court now sits, and I can remember walking it off and coming up with this brilliant idea uh, to build a grass tennis court that looked like Wimbledon's center court and uh, had that dream for uh, a long time before we acted on it. But uh, finally, 50 years later, um, the court was built and I got invited to uh, work with the Wimbledon ground staff. In 2012, Mark was given the honor of being an intern with the Wimbledon ground staff. After having his request denied three times, he and his wife were finally able to experience the hallowed grounds of Wimbledon firsthand. The first time I was taken on an all-encompassing tour of the grounds and about an hour into it I couldn't even tell you where we were. Wilmington's a large, it's, it's a large area. All of a sudden I was in a building and they were taking me on something called the Champions Walk. And this is the same walk that the players go from the dressing room into center court. And so we walked down the stairs where the, the rose water dish is and that's the trophy that the women's play for and the men's championship trophy, they're on display. And then all of a sudden, they opened up two big doors to center court, and there it was. And I really didn't even want to step on it. It was, it was so amazing to see it. It was, uh, you know, it was the fulfillment of a dream I had 50 years ago. That fulfillment of a dream continues today as Mark invites visitors from all across the world to play on his grass tennis court. People come. I think from 25 different states this summer traveled to Charles City to play on grass. It's so rare to be able to play on grass like Mark Kuhn's court. And when they found out that it existed, it is the classic, if you build it, they will come. They come to, to experience it and then it develops friendships. And uh, I know Mark has had people coming in uh, repeatedly because they had so much fun playing on the grass and coming to Charles City. With an established following of tennis lovers already making the trip to rural Iowa, the cornfields of Charles City provide the perfect destination for Brian Parrott and Mark Kuhn to plant the seeds for the American Tennis Hall of Fame. They said, where is Charles City anyway? You know, and you don't expect people to drive you know, all the way there just for a Hall of Fame. Without the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, and probably nobody would know where Cooperstown, New York is, but anybody that follows baseball knows about that Hall of Fame. And that's a city of only 2,000, but people go there every year for the inductions and they've done a beautiful job. So, I, you know, and obviously we knew that it was, it's not a place that anybody really knows about except, but having it in a little community that would in, embrace it um, and the reaction in Charles City was very positive. We got a couple of people who donated uh, old rackets uh, to me with the hope that they would someday be shown in the American Tennis Hall of Fame and some really quite nice old rackets. This racket here is one that uh, a resident of Charles City gave to me after she learned that we were trying to build the American Tennis Hall of Fame here. The Midwest mindset of taking pride in where you're from is the exact type of value Mike Stridham sees being beneficial for the Hall of Fame. 
Never have I felt at home as I have in Iowa. People are good, people are kind, people want to stop and help. I think what happens in the Midwest, um, a lot of older heritage, a lot of farming families um, that have felt the hurt of poor economies, uh, bad recessions, and they know that to get through these things you need each other. And I think the Midwest is real special like that. There's never been a point where I've asked for help and haven't gotten it in the Midwest. There's never been a point where um, somebody hasn't been there for me in the Midwest. So I think Charles City is real symbolic of the Midwest as a whole and that there's good, wholesome people who want to help, want to be good, and who just love their sport and love to be outside. And I do think the fact that he's tried to locate, he's attempting to locate this Hall of Fame in Charles City has a certain attraction to it. It's not a place that I would otherwise visit. If the American Hall of Tennis Hall of Fame were there, I'd be honored to visit it. And uh, I think it's a great concept. It is in our heartland. It's like the sweet spot of a racket. You know, it feels so good when you hit it right in the center. And Charles City is right in the center. It's not that Charles City is a, is a mecca or a tennis center in the United States. Certainly we're not. But we are strategically located in the middle of the country. And um, you'd be surprised who, who passes through here solely to come play tennis. <laughs> I was amazed by that. So I think they'd uh, find the American Tennis Hall of Fame uh, very interesting. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity right in the middle of America to do something. And Brian's got the vision to pull it off. And he's recruited a lot of great people to help. And I, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to be a part of, of this core group helping to get this thing going. It's a, it's a thought and concept long overdue in America. That core group of people will be tasked with ultimately deciding who will be enshrined in the Hall of Fame. So now our committee uh, is a coach from Stanford, Dick Gould, a great player uh, from California named Dennis Ralston, a great coach from Florida named Nick Boliteri, another great player named Pam Austin who is involved, Julie Heldman, and um, it is really, the committee is all around the country. We, we're in Charles City, but we're communicating around, we'll have representation from all over the United States on the committee. This summer, on the first day of the 2015 Wimbledon tournament, the nominees for the initial class of inductees will be announced. The selection committee has between the Wim end of Wimbledon and will announce the selections on the first day of the U.S. Open when everybody in the United States is paying attention to tennis. Things like the American Tennis Hall of Fame will help take the lead to inspire young Americans to get out to the courts and try to capitalize and, and, and make the most of their game and to play more tennis. Our mission is to preserve history, honor excellence, and connect generations. And the connect generations is as important as anything so that kids can find out that they're part of a sport that goes back a long time. In the American Tennis Hall of Fame, there will be three categories, players, coaches, and apostles. Now the players are gonna be some of the biggest names in U.S. history. John McEnroe, Jimmy Connors, Don Budge on the men's side, Poncha Gonzalez, Andre Agassi, they're all gonna be eventually into the American Tennis Hall of Fame. On the women's side, very important figures in the country, Billie Jean King, who did a lot for women's sports, and Chris Everett, and Althea Gibson was the first black uh, woman that she won Wimbledon in 1958. Amazing athlete. Arthur Ashe would be another one that'll be. The coaches will include such names as Dick Gould, who led Stanford to 17 NCAA titles, as well as Eleanor Teach Tennant, Nick Saviano, and Nick Boliteri. Now the third category, after the coaches, players, coaches, is the apostles of the game. Those people, not players, not coaches, but did tremendous amount. On the men's side, I would say one of the nominees will be Dwight Davis, who in 1900, 115 years ago, had an idea that countries should learn each other's culture by playing tennis. For in your country, we flip a coin, we'll play the first match in your country, the next time we play, it'll be in our country. And it became known as the Davis Cup. And now there's 135 nations playing Davis Cup. What Dwight Davis did for tennis internationally is incredible. 
One woman who is imperative to the Apostle category is Gladys Heldman. Among leading other projects, Heldman is the co-founder of the Women's Tennis Association. And I admired her very much and uh, I was driving across the country and I called her and I, I told her what I was thinking about and she said, Brian, they've already forgotten who I am and in a few years they're not going to even, they won't even know who Chris Everett is. And she was correct. And the American Tennis Hall of Fame should, should correct that situation. The passion and ambition put forth by Brian and the rest of the committee is finally correcting that situation. Soon, tennis in our country will have a home, right in Charles City, America's sweet spot.